Good morning, Antioch, Wichita. My name is Drew Stedman. I'm the U.S. Director for the Antioch Movement. I so wish I could be with you this morning. I am myself a Kansas native. In fact, right now I'm in Kansas City and I love any chance I get to be with you all in your church and uh, just worshiping with you. So proud and thankful that we get to walk together. Um, it is fun that I get the opportunity to share with you today and as we dive into what I really consider to be one of the most significant stories in the New Testament, um, the story of Cornelius that we're going to find in Acts chapter 10. You know, we hear a lot of people these days talking about a new normal, and that's actually the sermon series title that we're going through right now in Waco. We're calling it New Normal, and I don't know about you, but at this point, I'm kind of content with any kind of normal. You know what I'm saying? It's like Every time I think like, okay, things are finally going to calm down a little bit, there's some other change, just change after change. It's like, just give me some kind of routine. Give me something stable. It feels like we're stuck in this ongoing change, and it doesn't seem like it's slowing down at all. I had this experience a couple weeks ago. You know, my wife and I, we had this really crazy uh, miracle story where we had the opportunity to go on a vacation to Hawaii. We've been looking forward to it all year. But then right about the beginning of June, uh, we were scheduled to go at the end of the month. It became apparent, like, we're not going to be able to go to Hawaii right now. They're just the the regulations. It's just not going to work. So we were disappointed. And we said, okay, well, let's let's do something else. So we we rebooked a trip. This time, we were going to go to a resort in Florida. I was still very excited about it. And you can probably tell where this is going. Because as we got ready and we got closer, the week before we're supposed to go to Florida, things really hit up. And then the very day before we're supposed to leave, All of a sudden it dawned on us like, we can't go to Florida, it's not gonna work. So I had to cancel our trip and we're scrambling, you know, our our peaceful vacation. I'm on the phone all day trying to figure out where can we go instead. And we finally ended up uh, booking a trip to the Texas coast to Galveston. Now, I'm really thankful for Galveston. It's an underrated place. I enjoy going there. It's just not Hawaii, a little different. And I had this moment as I'm driving down to Galveston You know, I'm thinking like right now, I am supposed to be on the beach in Hawaii with perfect weather looking out over the ocean. And instead, I looked out my car window and I was in Houston traffic. Like, I didn't think I was gonna be here right now. I thought I would be somewhere else. It's change. And all of us are dealing with this. All of us have experienced change. We thought we would be somewhere and we ended up somewhere else. It's the story of 2020. And I recognize for some of you, uh, some of this change has been really significant. There's been an acute sense of loss and pain, and please know that we are praying for you. Uh, For some of us, change has had very real consequences. All of us are dealing with change. All of us are trying to make sense of our world. All of us are experiencing the shaking that is going on in our world today. Now, the good news is I believe that's right at the very heart of the passage we're going to be reading today in Acts chapter 10. Uh, How do we grapple with change and maybe more foundationally, where is God in the midst of it? Now, this story in the book of Acts, it, it comes right on the heels of the Apostle Paul's conversion experience. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9 about how this man who was the great persecutor of the church, God intervened in his life. He met him in power, and Paul gave his heart to Jesus, and he became one of the great leaders of the church. It's this incredible story that should fill us all with hope that God can use anyone. We're never too far gone for, too far gone for God to use us. And at the end of this story, kind of before we get into our passage this morning, there's this verse I want to read. And you find it in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. I'm going to read it for us today because it kind of summarizes the Paul story. It says this, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. That sounds to me like a fairy tale ending. It's amazing. It's like everything was perfect. Life was great. The church was growing. There were no problems. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it almost feels like that should be the ending of the book of Acts. Everything finally got to this ideal spot, and then Jesus came back, and the world was great. But that's not what happens in this story. And in fact, if you read this passage closely, you're going to notice there's a really big problem. 
At the very beginning of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is what many people believe to be the thesis statement for the whole book. And I'm going to read it for us. It says this. It says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And if you're reading closely, what you're going to notice in that passage I read earlier, Acts chapter 9, 31, there's a really big problem. Because what happened? The church was being strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's taken place. The, the church had spread to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Galilee, to Samaria. All of that had happened. The Jewish territory was alive. God was moving and the church was being strengthened. However, however, the gospel had not yet gone to the ends of the earth. And what we're gonna notice today when we read the story of Cornelius, that's a big problem because this is going outside of Jewish territory into Gentile territory. And that hadn't happened yet. So even though maybe the church felt like they were at this place of peace, God is about to come in and mess everything up. Change is coming. It's kind of like if you're watching a movie sometimes, you know, and uh, maybe halfway through the show, it gets to this part where everything seems peaceful and nice. And you're sitting there, you're like, okay, there's still an hour left in this movie. Like something's about to happen here. The characters in the story, they don't know it yet, but their world's about to get messed up. And if there's a movie made about 2020, it's like all of us celebrating the Chiefs' Super Bowl victory back in February. Everything was great. 50 years of waiting were finally fulfilled. We didn't know that our world was about to get messed up. Maybe it's that same emotion. That's what's happening right here in Acts chapter 9, 31. The church was at a happy point, but God was about to break in and change things. And this really is Acts, the whole book. It's maybe the theme of the book. I think Acts is a story of change. It's the story of, of how God led his church in ways that nobody thought were gonna happen. So bear with me for a minute here because I, I want you to picture yourself as one of the very first Christians. In Acts chapter one, we read about this very small group of believers. They were entirely Jewish and they were with the resurrected Jesus. Uh, Peter was being appointed as the leader of the church and they were all living together, this very intimate community based in Jerusalem. That's how the book of Acts starts. And these people, they experience the power of God at Pentecost. They're still doing life together, almost in all of them living in Jerusalem. Acts 2 tells us how they're meeting every single day in the temple courts and house to house. Like it's this very idyllic community that's experiencing God together. That's how the book of Acts begins. But by the end of the book of Acts, everything is different. The, we find in church history that shortly after the events, it Acts covers about a 30-year time span, shortly after the events of this book take place, the Roman army came through and destroyed Jerusalem and leveled the temple building, raised it all the way down to the ground. So the church building that the church first met in was completely destroyed. And by the end of Acts, the church is no longer primarily based in Jerusalem, but now it's based in places like Rome or Ephesus or Antioch or Alexandria. We, we find that the church, you know, at the beginning of Acts, it's led by Jesus and Peter. By the end of Acts, it's led by Paul. Now, think about that for a second. You know, I, I can imagine it'd be a pretty hard pill to swallow, like if you're used to Jesus being your pastor and he gets replaced by Peter. I mean, that's a tough act to follow. I, I know Peter was a good guy, but he's not Jesus. But think about the transition from going to being led by Peter to being led by Paul. Paul is the guy that used to try to kill you and now he's your pastor. Like seriously, talk about a search committee botching their job. There were probably Christians alive who lost family members to Paul and somehow they're supposed to be led by him. Can you imagine that kind of change, trying to deal with that kind of change? Wow. And maybe more foundationally, the church began almost entirely Jewish and by the end of Acts, we find the church is becoming almost entirely Gentile. Everything changed. Every sense of identity that these first Christians would have had is different. They thought they were gonna be here. And by the end of Acts, they ended up here. How do you deal with that kind of change? And maybe more foundationally, I have to believe that the believers are asking the question, is it okay? Is it even a good thing? Did we miss God? 
or is he in this? And I think this is in the background as Luke is writing this story of the church. I, I think one of the things that's going on here is Luke is trying to demonstrate that no, this is not some accident. This is not a problem. We did not lose our way. In fact, it was God himself who led us into this change. And I believe that that's a message for us living in 2020 because that same spirit's doing the same thing in our day. Well, let's read our passage this morning. Acts chapter 10, story of Cornelius. I'm gonna start with the first eight verses. You can read along with me starting in verse one. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And one day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. And he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius, he stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying, was staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that happened and sent them to Joppa. So several things going on in this story. We are introduced to our main character, a man named Cornelius. But there's a problem with Cornelius because Cornelius is not a Jew, he's a Gentile. And Jewish people at this time, they were not allowed to associate with Gentiles. They were not allowed to eat with Gentiles. They could not go into the homes of Gentiles. God is not supposed to speak to Gentiles. And yet, Cornelius is at the very heart of our story today. But Cornelius is not just a normal Gentile. Cornelius is a Roman soldier. I mean, do you remember earlier I told you how Roman armies came through and destroyed Jerusalem and leveled the temple to the ground? Well, it was people like Cornelius who did that. He is not supposed to be on God's team. Cornelius represents the army that God is supposed to destroy, not the type of person that God is supposed to speak to. You know, Cornelius, maybe another way of saying it is he is on the other team. He is the raiders to our chiefs. He is not the kind of person that God is going to move through. But Cornelius, he's not just a Gentile. He's not just a Roman soldier. He's a centurion. He is a leader in the Roman army. He's like a captain. And he's not just a centurion, but he's a member of the Italian regiment. Like he's an inner circle. He's, he's connected to the leadership of the Roman army based in Italy. And we have this picture of the opposite of the person that we expect to be somebody that God is gonna move through. And yet God speaks to him anyway. And what does he say? He says, go to Joppa to find a guy named Peter. Now, Joppa also holds some significance. And for those of you familiar with the Old Testament, you may be familiar with the story of the prophet Jonah. And it's a very short book in the Old Testament. Uh, it tells a story of Jonah's life and has a lot of lessons for us. You're welcome to check it out and read it for yourself. And if you read the story of Jonah carefully, there's actually quite a few parallels to the story that we're reading today. And in that story, God spoke to this prophet and he gave him a very similar message. He said, Jonah, I want you to take my message to Nineveh, which at that time, Nineveh was like Rome. They were the bad guys. They were the ones oppressing the people of God. They were the ones that God was supposed to come and destroy. And the whole book of Jonah is Jonah wrestling with this. He's like, God, why would I go to them? Aren't you supposed to fight them? Why would you want me to go bring your word to them? It doesn't make any sense. And Jonah actually runs away. He goes in the opposite direction. He doesn't go to where God tells him to go because he doesn't think the Gentiles deserve the word of God. And where does Jonah go? He goes to Joppa, the very same place that we find Peter today. And the message to us is that the gospel message is going to the people that we don't think deserve it. God's plan is a whole lot bigger than Peter realized and I think is a lot bigger than we realize. Well, let's keep reading our story. The scene is shifting now. It's like the camera pans over to Peter and Joppa, and let's read what happens here, starting picking back up in verse nine. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the rooftop to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. 
It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit ahead said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Now, this is a bizarre story. It's like there's a sheep being let down from heaven with a bunch of animals that Peter is supposed to be to eat. And to understand what's going on here, we need to recognize that Jewish people followed strict dietary laws. And there were, there were a lot of animals that they were not allowed to eat, uh, pigs or pork products or shellfish or things like that. And so what's happening, Peter's having this vision where he's seeing the animals that he's not supposed to eat, and God is telling them to eat them. And it's maybe hard for us to understand, hard for us to wrap our head around. You know, as, you know, 2,000 years later, like this story actually sounds kind of cool. Can you imagine? You know, maybe tomorrow you're like sitting on your couch in your living room, you know, cup of coffee in hand and you're worshiping Jesus. And then all of a sudden you hear this voice from heaven. It's like, Drew, you're like, yes, God, Drew, I am sending men to your house today and they're gonna bring you bacon and shrimp. Eat it. I'm like, yes, God, hallelujah, amen. You know, I mean, I, I would love that to happen to me, but that's not what's going on here. This is not some version of heavenly Uber Eats. Actually, this right here cuts right at the very heart of what it meant to be a member of God's chosen people. And I've got to go back into the Old Testament to explain just the power, the significance of what's taking place here in this moment in our story. If you start in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, it tells the story about how God created the world, but then it describes how sin entered the world and corrupted God's good creation. There's quite a few very interesting stories that follow, but then we get to Genesis chapter 10, and it tells us the story of what's known as the Tower of Babel. And in this story, what we discover are all the nations of the earth are united together in rebellion against God. And God comes down, he sees this rebellion. And so what he does is God shows up and he strikes their language so that people no longer understand each other. And they start talking in a bunch of different tongues or languages. It's where we get the English word babbling. And the nations start to babbling. They can no longer be united together because of this. And so they are separated, they cover the earth and no longer are able to come together unified in their rebellion. And if you keep reading in Genesis 12, we see that out of the chaos of this of the nations, God calls one man, a man named Abram, and through Abram, God commits to create a new nation. And this new nation is not gonna be like the rebellious nations. This new nation is set apart to God. They are called to be distinct. They are called to be different. They are called to be God's chosen people. And God gives them signs of their distinction, things that they are supposed to do or not do, so that they can be constantly reminded that they are different. They are not like the nations of the earth. And one of those signs is the way that they are supposed to eat their food. It's like God saying to them, don't pollute yourself with the idolatry and the rebellion of the Gentiles. Don't allow it to enter into your body. Every time you eat, you are being reminded that you're not like them. You're set apart to me. I was trying to think of a modern parallel and I thought about the fact that I wear a wedding ring. And I wear this, I never take it off. It's a sign to me of my distinction. I am in covenant, I am set apart. I am no longer like everybody else. And every time I see this or feel this, I'm reminded about who I am. That's maybe a parallel to what, what's happening here. And in the book of Leviticus, over and over again, it's like God is constantly showing his people that you're different. Now, if you've ever tried to read the Bible from cover to cover, you're gonna immediately remember the fact that Leviticus is a very hard book to read. A lot of Bible reading plans go to die in the book of Leviticus. But if you understand this whole idea of distinction, it starts to make more sense. Like God is giving them this to remind them that they're different. I wanna read Genesis chapter 11, 45 through 47, because I think it maybe describes a little bit about what's going on 
that Peter might have been experiencing. It says this, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. These are the regulations concerning animals, birds, every living thing that moves about in the water and every creature that moves along the ground. You must distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between the living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. In other words, be different. Don't defile yourself with the Gentiles or their food. And as you go on to read the Old Testament, here's what you find. God's chosen people in his nation that is set apart, they are never particularly powerful. In fact, they're almost always weak. They're slaves. They're nomads in the desert. They're a loose confederation of tribes. They're a small kingdom surrounded by powerful empires. They're living in exile. They're oppressed. And every single stage of Israel's history, there is this constant pressure for them to conform to the world. Just throw in the towel. The nations are more powerful than you. Just become like them. Worship their gods. Why, why be different anymore? Just be like the world. And yet over and over again, God raised up voices of prophets and their message was, don't give in. Don't lose your distinction. Don't lose your identity. You're set apart to follow God. And in the end, God's kingdom is gonna win. Don't become like the world. It's a message for us living in our day and age as well. Be different, be set apart. And if you go on to read Jewish history, you'll find this really comes to a head uh, when several Greek kings ruled over Israel. There's one in particular who he made it his mission to destroy the Jewish faith. He had his soldiers storm into the temple and they sacrificed a pig, an unclean animal on the altar of the Lord and they worshiped Zeus, the Greek God. And then they tried to kill any Israelite who refused to bow down to idols. And one of the aspects of that is they tried to force people to defile themselves with unclean food. In fact, there's one story of a 90-year-old man and these Greek soldiers shoved pork into his mouth and they tried to force him to eat it. And this 90-year-old man spit it back out in defiance. And he said, I've lived 90 years following my God. I'm not going to compromise now. And they threatened him and he still refused to give in. So they eventually tortured him to death because he would not eat unclean food. There's another story about a mother and her seven sons. Same thing happened. They bring this family before these soldiers. They put a plate of defiled food before them. They tell them, if you don't eat this, we're going to torture you and kill you. The first, the oldest son, he defies these Greek rulers, refuses to eat their food and is tortured to death. Same thing happens the second, the third, until finally all seven sons are murdered. And then the mother is the only one left, but she too is defiant. And she says, I have no regrets. I refuse to give in. And she too is killed. Guys, these are the stories that Peter would have grown up with. This is what it means, just how significant it is to not lose your distinction. This is why he is complaining to God. This is why he has to have this vision three times because this is not just an issue of what food we can eat. This is not just an issue of legalism. This is not about pork being inherently sinful or not. This is about identity, what it means to be God's people. And God is stepping into this world and he's changing everything. And hopefully as we read this, maybe we understand a bit more the significance of what's happening in our story this morning. It'll help you make sense a little bit as we keep reading. I'm gonna um, jump ahead to verse 23. It says this, the next day, Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Joppa went along and the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent me? I, do you see what's happening here? The significance, I mean, Peter's mind is getting blown right now. And, and he's just saying, okay, God, if this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. Cornelius goes on to describe what happens and Peter's recognizing the, the power of this moment. And so he starts to preach the gospel message to them. 
Uh, Bible scholars refer sometimes to this story as the Gentile Pentecost. And if you read Acts chapter two, you'll find a lot of similarities. And the story is almost identical. And Peter preaches almost the same message that he preached in Acts 2. And he preaches that same message here in Acts 10. And here's what that means. That means the gospel is not just the gospel for the Jews, but the gospel is equally the gospel for the Gentiles. That Jesus, God himself, became man. He confronted the power of darkness. He was murdered for our sake. And on the third day, he rose again so that we all can have life in his name. This is not just for one nation. This is for all the nations. This is God's plan, not just to redeem his chosen nation of Israel, but to redeem the rebellious nations of Genesis 10. It's all culminating in this moment. In other words, the world is changing far beyond what any of us ever thought possible. Well, Peter is preaching the gospel message, but I love what happens next. And we're gonna pick it back up in verse 44. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, like he's in the middle of his sermon. He has not yet gotten to his conclusion, his last story. He has not yet gotten to his altar call when suddenly the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And Peter said, can anyone keep them from being baptized? With water, they've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. I mean, it's almost kind of rude. Like the Holy Spirit literally interrupted Peter's message. He didn't even let him finish preaching when his presence was poured out on the group. I mean, I, I pray, Lord, let this happen someday. It's like every preacher's dream. Can you can you imagine we're in the middle of church and, you know, Pastor Rob's in the middle of his, his sermon and all of a sudden the power of God descends on the room and everybody's filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, that's gotta be the most amazing thing ever. And that's what's taking place in this story. And in addition to this just being this really incredible story of the power of God, there's also something significant that we might miss if we're not careful. Do you remember earlier when I talked to you about Genesis 10, the story of the Tower of Babel? What happened in this story? The nations of the earth were united in rebellion against God. And so God divided them into tongues. And the tongues at that point were a sign of their rebellion and their disunity. Do you understand what's happening here? Do you understand what's happening here? It's it's an incredible reversal. It's a sign that God is making all things new. Because in this story, tongues are not a sign of rebellion anymore. Tongues are not a sign of division anymore. Instead, tongues are a sign of redemption and a sign of unity. Because in this story, instead of you nations coming together to try to rebel against God, this is the story of God coming down to the earth to the nations to unite them back to himself. And tongues, the very thing that used to divide them, are now the thing that unites them. And this is all happening by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is making all things new. He's redeeming the curse of sin. And in this moment, the disciples are blown away watching this. God just came down and changed everything. His redemptive plan was unfolding right before their very eyes. And it's so much bigger than they ever thought possible. I've experienced this before. I don't know about you. I think of times where I've been in uh, places like South Asia, I've been in these rural villages, uh, these small house churches, and I remember packing into these tiny rooms, and I'm surrounded by people that are different from me. Yeah, I remember these, these ladies next to me, and we literally have nothing in common. I don't speak their language, they don't speak mine. I don't understand their culture or their background, and they don't understand mine. There is nothing in the natural that, that would unite us. But as we gather in that house church and we start to worship, something takes place. As we lift up the name of Jesus, as the Holy Spirit's poured out on the room, suddenly we're encountering the presence of God together and there's this unity that takes place that words cannot describe where we are united. And that unity that takes place by the Spirit is deeper than anything that I could conjure up. Any attempt that I could make to unite us together would fall short. There's just simply too many barriers. But we have a Holy Spirit within us that transcends them all. It's the power of the gospel. 
It's the power of the gospel for God to call the church back to himself. And Peter, you know, to his credit, he finally is understanding what's going on. He's like, hey, can anybody keep these people from being water baptized? Like anyone? Who's going to argue with this? And that's actually a big deal. Baptism was originally a conversion ceremony for Gentiles who wanted to become Jews, where they would lose their Gentile Roman identity and be remade as a member of God's chosen people. And there's a lot of symbolism to water. You see it throughout the Old Testament. I mean, even the creation story. But it's Noah's flood where water washes the sin away from the earth. It's the Exodus where Israel leaves slavery and crosses through the water into freedom. It's the crossing of the Jordan River where they leave behind the desert. They pass through the water into the promise. And baptism is this symbol that my old Jewish identity is being washed away. And I'm being born into a member of God's family. I'm passing through the water together with Israel. And it's very similar to baptism as we understand it today, but there's one major distinction in this story because there is nothing in this story that indicates that Cornelius stopped being a Roman. He never gave up his Roman identity, but he was still born again into God's chosen people. And I'm not sure that we can all understand just what a big deal that is. It had an earth-shattering, world-changing impact that all of a sudden, it's not just one nation, but all the nations can be baptized and become members of God's chosen people. And in that moment, everything changed. Everything changed. You know, sometimes with baptism, we can so focus on the personal side of baptism that I personally, my sin has been washed away and I've been born again, and that's absolutely true. But there's another side of baptism that's a corporate side of baptism, that I've been born again as a member of God's chosen people, that my identity has changed. My, my Gentile nation or my Gentile identity, my rebellion against God is washed away, and now I've been remade as a member of God's chosen people. But the power of being a member of God's chosen people is it's not just one culture, it's not just one tongue, but it's all the nations of the earth. And all of us together someday will stand before the throne of God, worshiping and praising him. And we get these little glimpses of heaven like I described earlier. But this is my new identity and this is bigger than anything else that I'll ever experience. Well, hopefully by this point, you're, you're understanding what a big deal this is. And it helps us to see what happens next because when the other Christians find out about what Peter just did, understandably, they're, they're not happy about it. They're like, Peter, you, you read this in Acts chapter 11. Like, what did you do, man? Did you just give up our nation's identity that we've carried for more than a thousand years and died for? Are you just gonna flippantly throw away what it means to be God's chosen people? They criticize him and rightfully so. And Peter, I love his response. Uh, he's like, hey, hey, this wasn't my doing. Like, it's not my fault. I'm not the one who did this. It was the Holy Spirit who did this. You know, a unique thing about the book of Acts is it's hard to identify a main character in the book of Acts. It's like, it's not really Peter. It's not really Paul. Who is it? But I think it's actually pretty obvious. The main character in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit. He is mentioned 56 times. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll notice every single change that takes place, every single time the, the believers thought they'd be here and they ended up here, every single time it's the Holy Spirit's fault. And if you read our story today, the Holy Spirit is the one who gave Cornelius this word. The Holy Spirit is the one who put Peter in a trance. And the Holy Spirit is the one who poured out his power before Peter could even finish preaching a message. The Holy Spirit did not ask Peter's permission to fill the Gentiles with himself. And that's Peter's defense. He's like, guys, I didn't do this. The Holy Spirit did this. Who was I to stop the Holy Spirit? And I love verse 18, Acts 11, verse 18, because I, I think it's this one of the most beautiful passages and maybe a prophetic picture of who we're called to be. It says this, when they heard this, they had no further objections and they praised God, saying, so then God has granted even the Gentiles' repentance unto life. In other words, what the church is saying, they're saying, we're not in charge. We don't understand this change, 
We may not like this change. I think a lot of the things that happened in the church would have been very difficult for those first believers. But their attitude, when ultimately when this stuff happens, their attitude is, is not looking inward at their self. Their attitude is instead submitting themselves to the leadership of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and saying, wow, God, if this is what you wanna do, then so be it. You're in control, not me. You're the king, not me. You're the leader of the church and not me. Let it be so of us. I'll just say for me personally during this time, there's a lot of change. I don't know what the world's gonna look like. I don't know when the change is gonna stop. I have a hunch I'm not gonna like all of this change. And there, there's a very fair and healthy place of grief that comes with that. And I don't wanna minimize that at all. And I, I don't know, I think some of the changes, I'm not saying God is the one causing all of the change. I, I don't know, that's, that's above my pay grade. But what I am doing is I'm using this opportunity to get down on my knees again and say, Jesus, you're in control. Jesus, this is not about me. And I'm repenting, saying, God, where have I tried to take control? Where have I viewed myself as the one who's driving my life? And instead, surrendering that at the altar. You see, I think what's happening right now is all of our cultural idols are being confronted. Our world is being shaken. Our assumptions are being tested. And this is an opportunity for us as the people of God to submit ourselves again to the leadership of the Spirit and saying, lead us. Lead us, Holy Spirit. I repent where I've tried to lead myself. You're in control. Let that be our prayer. Let the example of the early church be our example. Because I think that's the whole message of the book of Acts is to say the world is gonna change and sometimes that change is gonna be difficult. But the Holy Spirit is the one who's leading us through it all. And that's the word for us this morning. The book of Acts ends in a very weird way. It's just this abrupt ending. And some Bible scholars, there's a lot of speculation. Some are like, did Luke die while he was writing this? Like, why is there no conclusion? But I think it's very simple why there's no conclusion to Acts. Because the story's not finished yet. We only have 28 chapters in scripture, but I think there's a lot more chapters being written in heaven right now. I don't know what chapter we're on. I don't know how many more chapters are left to be written. But I do know the same Holy Spirit that led the church through the first 28 chapters is still the same Holy Spirit leading the church through the rest of the chapters. And I want my attitude to be the same that I see in this church of Holy Spirit, lead us, we follow you. Because as we wrap up our time, it's amazing to see what God has done. You know, for 2000 years, Christians have gathered together on Sunday mornings to celebrate the resurrection. And I love sometimes just to reflect and think about what goes on all around the world. You know, if you look at a map, uh, just look at geography, we're actually some of the very last ones in North America to wake up each, each Sunday and worship. And, and on a Sunday morning, when the sun first rises, the very first people to gather are those in the Pacific Islands, like quite literally the uttermost parts of the earth, places like Fiji or Micronesia. And today, those islands are almost entirely Christians. And they wake up and they're the ones who kick off this day of worship. And then the sun keep rising and it gets to places like the Philippines or Indonesia where there's powerful moves of God going on today. The sun rises on South Korea, which is one of the most Christian places in the world. Some of the most dynamic intercessors and missionaries that you'll ever meet. And they join in worship. And then the sun rises and China wakes up where there's a hundred million or more believers, most of them gathered in underground house churches under the threat of persecution to worship our Savior. And the sun keep rising. It gets to places like Mongolia or Siberia where I have friends that are worshiping Jesus, maybe some of them even watching today. It hits South Asia, like talked about earlier. Uh, so much incredible worship coming out of that place. Then the sun gets to places like Central America, I mean, Central Asia or the Middle East, which for a long time were considered some of the most difficult places for the gospel. But today we're seeing incredible moves of God. In fact, some people believe that the most dynamic, um, fastest growing church in the world is actually in Iran. The sun keeps rising and it finally hits the mighty continent of Africa. If there were to be a capital of Christianity in the world today, it'd be found somewhere in Africa. It's the most Christian place in the world, more than 600 million believers. And as we look to the future, I think it's the Africans that are gonna lead the church. And it's already happening. In fact, as the sun rises on Europe, some of the great renewal movements are being led by the Africans. Praise Jesus.
Well, then the sun crosses the Atlantic and it hits Latin America. And if Africa is the capital of Christianity in, uh, in the world today, Latin America is not too far behind them. And Latin America erupts with worship of people praising the Savior. And then finally, after all of that, after the world has been bathed in worship, the sun rises on us. And we're some of the very last to join in the heavenly chorus. And I think about that. And I think all of that started when Peter crossed the threshold into Cornelius's house, there was change that was taking place. The change was probably pretty painful for the people that experienced it, but that change is the reason that we join in worship today. And that change is the reason that worship is erupting all across the world today. Friends, the Holy Spirit is a great leader and he knows what he's doing. Let's trust him this morning.